Welcome to the Church and Culture Podcast, a weekly discussion with Dr. James Emery White on the latest trends happening in culture and where and how the church should respond. Jim is the founding and senior pastor of Mecklenburg Community Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, president of Serious Times, a ministry devoted to exploring the intersection of faith and culture, former professor of theology and culture at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, where he also served as their fourth president, and the author of more than 20 books. I am your host, Alexis Dry, and I can't wait to dive into this week's conversation. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. In a previous episode, you probably heard Jim and I mention a series that he did at Mecklenburg Community Church, gosh, a couple years ago now, maybe more than a couple of years ago, but it was such a huge hit that we just keep talking about it. Um, it was called, essentially, Is It Okay for a Christian to... And then dot, dot, dot. And each week, you chose a particular hot topic issue um, and then gave a Christian perspective on how you might use wisdom to determine whether doing a particular thing would be best or really even acceptable for you at all. Um, So some of the topics that you tackled were things like doing yoga, um, watching... You said Game of Thrones, but really just watching any kind of mature TV shows, getting a tattoo, being cremated, um, and on it goes. And so today, I thought that we might talk about two of the topics that you tackled in that series, um, particularly smoking marijuana and drinking. But before we jump into the specifics, can you just remind our listeners again of the biblical framework that helps us understand how we might decide whether something would be wise for us to do or not? Yeah, I think one of the reasons why it was a popular series is because I purposely chose um, confusing issues that there's gray area or the Bible doesn't speak maybe particularly directly to or Christians seemed conflicted about and non-Christians were curious about. So yeah, it, it was. Uh, and what I did was at the very beginning, I, I put forward kind of a matrix that we were going to run all of these subjects through. And um, it actually ended up, that matrix ended up being part of a book. Um, uh, people want to go further on it called After I Believe where I netted out a whole section on on this matrix. But here it is in short. First, when you have an issue, like like we're going to talk about, um, you go to the Bible. That seems obvious, but first you go to the Bible. And if you're going to explore what it means to follow Christ and whether it's okay to do something in relation to being a Christ follower, you're going to go to the ultimate authority for following Christ, which is the Bible. So we go to the Bible and see what it has to say. And so on, and you do this with any, you could do this with any issue and, and, and something like smoking marijuana or wine, you're going to find that it's going to tell you one of three things when you go to the Bible. Uh, it's either going to say, absolutely, you're free to do that. It's going to give you permission or second. And if it does, fine, you're done. Okay. You know, love one another. Okay. I can love, <laughs> you know, I don't have to worry about that. Um, it could also give a very clear and direct prohibition, meaning it says unequivocally, do not do this under no circumstances. It's unequivocally, this is, you know, something that uh, is a sin. Uh, and, you know, you can find all kinds of things where scripture uses extremely strong language. And if the Bible speaks, of, you know, authoritatively to something and gives a clear and resounding no, well, then you don't have to waste any more energy on that either. Then, you know, even if you don't like the answer, you've got the answer and it's clear. But what we can also find, and this is a third thing that the Bible can offer, is a kind of a, a blend. And this is where a lot of these issues get uh, confusing for people. There's often a, uh, the Bible give a, yes, you can do this, but. Or, well, most of the time, no, but sometimes, yes. And you, you're navigating this. So instead of an unqualified yes or a straightforward no, you find this guiding set of principles for our engagement, which means we find ourselves in the biblical arena of freedom. And you're free in Christ to do something, and but here are the principles that speak to that freedom, that inform that freedom. Uh, you know, here's the wisdom, here's the counsel, here, here are the boundary lines as you pursue and you explore and experience this freedom that you have in Christ in this particular area. And so the principles inform the freedom. But it's not just about your freedom. There's more to this the matrix. It's not just your freedom as you follow the principles. Let's say I have the freedom to do something in Christ and I follow all of the principles involved I, or I set out at least to follow all of the principles involved. But for me and how I'm wired up and my history and my personality and my temperament, my DNA, my family of origin, you fill in the blank, my individuality 
and its in its particularity uh, doesn't make it smart for me to exercise that freedom that I actually do have in Christ to pursue. So when I get to the wisdom category, uh, it may be that it's not foolish for you to do it, but it's foolish for me to do it. Um, and maybe on another subject, it's vice versa. And so we have to explore how wisdom comes into play as individuals as we walk through that particular subject and the principles involved. And then the final dynamic has to do with how our life plays out in terms of the community in which we are a part. Uh, because all of us live in community. We have families, we have neighborhoods, we have places of work. So finally, at the end of the process, we have to ask ourselves, um, how does something play out in terms of community and specifically your witness as a Christ follower before a watching world? Uh, you don't want to do anything, even in your freedom, that would be interpreted in our culture as a disavowal of the God that you say that you follow. And that's pretty rare, you know, for something to be seen as a disavowal. Uh, there's not a lot you can do where someone would say, well, you've just disavowed Jesus. Uh, you obviously do not follow Jesus at all. You must follow another God. You've made it very clear you follow another God. And in light of what we're going to be exploring, I'm sure we'll also get to how your freedom uh, might affect a fellow believer as well. Uh, but I, I'll let you kind of lead us along those paths and let it get to you get there when you want to. But to recap, you start with the Bible. And if it tells you yes or no, you have your answer. If instead it gives you principles for living that you must apply in freedom, then know those principles and apply those principles. Uh, but pursue that freedom in light of your witness and its effect on other people. Awesome. Thank you. That's really helpful. All right. So let's talk about smoking marijuana. Um, and okay, just to be clear on the front on the front end, we should distinguish between medicinal and recreational marijuana, right? I think we I think we have to, and I think we should, and I think it's important to separate those two. Uh, we're going to be talking uh, about the recreational use of marijuana, not the medical use. I, I don't, I don't really. There may be, but I don't know of any Christian ethicist uh, that would have any problem with the appropriately prescribed use of medical marijuana under the supervision of a physician. Um, and its most common use is pain control, uh, as well as to help with the nausea and the vomiting that can accompany uh, uh, when somebody receives chemotherapy for cancer. Uh, I think those are the most commonly prescribed uses, although there are others. So we're talking about recreational use of marijuana. Okay. Um, so on that note, then, in terms of recreational marijuana, I mean, you'll hear the age-old argument that, you know, it can be a gateway drug, that it increases your chances of getting lung infections, and that it's often linked to depression and other mental illnesses. And you can touch on that if you want to. But, but first, I thought, you know, why don't we talk about the fact that in most states, it is illegal to smoke marijuana recreationally. That's the case here in North Carolina. I, I think that's a good place to start this conversation honestly, in terms of whether or not it's okay for a Christian. If it's against the law where you live, then it's wrong for you, as if you're a Christ follower, to smoke it. I mean, that's a very short conversation. And it's not an ethical quandary. It's not something you have to anguish over or do great biblical study on. You're breaking the law, uh, period. Uh, here in North Carolina, as you mentioned, it is against the law. And if you're under that law, then as a Christ follower, you are not to break the law. This is very clear in the Bible. Paul makes it clear in his letter to the Romans in the 13th chapter. He goes and says very, very clearly, everyone should submit to the governing authorities. And we must be law abiding unless in following that law, we disobey God. Hmm. And then we are, you know, cannot follow the law. If the law is, you know, forcing us to disobey God. Um, but that's not the case in, <laughs> with marijuana. And another relevant application of this, which I know we're going to get to later, is this applies to drinking alcohol. If you are under the age of 21, then you as a Christ follower, that would be wrong for you. That would be breaking the law and you should not do it. Mm, okay. All right. So if it's not illegal where you live, should Christians then feel the freedom to smoke? All right. Well, here we get into it, don't right, we? Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the principle that applies no matter uh, where you live. And it's the principle that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that we must honor God with our body. Uh, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians um, 6. Uh, does using marijuana honor God with your body? Well, unlike alcohol, and it's good that we're, we're talking about both together, but we, there's some, some key distinctions between the two. Unlike alcohol, 
which again, I know we'll talk about in a minute. Marijuana is a psychoactive drug. It's a different category. What you're smoking is um, uh, Delta 9 uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, THC. That's a mouthful. As it's known. And it creates altered senses and an altered sense of time and hallucinations and sensations and images that seem real, even though they are not. It can bring about temporary paranoia. And that's just in the short term. Uh, long term use may reduce thinking, memory, uh, learning functions can be affected by this. That's how the brain builds connections between the areas necessary for those functions. Uh, smoking marijuana affects your lungs, just like any other kind of smoking, including the creation of breathing problems and lung illness and, and a higher risk for lung cancer. Because of its effect on your heart, you increase your chances for heart attack. Uh, it affects almost every organ of your body, as well as your nervous system and your immune system. Uh, except for medicinal use for pain, for example, there's no benefit to it whatsoever, only damage to your physical life. And the rest of your life, too. I mean, users um, report less academic success, less career success, higher likelihood of dropping out of school. Uh, it's linked to more job absences and accidents and injuries. The younger you start, the more debilitating it becomes and the more potentially addictive it becomes. And contrary to what a lot of people think, it, it can be very addictive. One out of every three users develops some degree of problem use. One out of every three. Uh, some people say it's not a gateway drug, but I was, I remember listening to a documentary uh, on the whole opioid crisis in America, which is sweeping uh, our nation and particularly heroin too, which is having a resurgence. Mm -hmm. And there was a health, a health expert who was being interviewed uh, about whether marijuana is a gateway drug. You know, that's debated back and forth. Is it a gateway drug? And he said, here's the simplest answer I know. Every single addict I deal with started with marijuana. Hmm. Every single one. I don't know the reports, he said. I, Quite frankly, I don't know the science. I just know that every single addict I deal with started with marijuana. You can do the math any way you want based on that. Hmm. Uh, and another thing too is the amount of THC in marijuana has gone up dramatically uh, in recent years. According to WebMD, uh, most leaves used to contain between 1% and 4% THC. Now most have close to 15% mm. THC. And marijuana ac uh, extracts used in dabbing and in edibles now can contain an average of 50% and up to 90% THC, which experts say increases the chances of addiction any more, even more, not to mention its mind-altering effects. Mm. And the Bible warns against losing control through intoxication. And unlike alcohol, which can take some time for it to hit and is easier to monitor in terms of intake, marijuana hits almost instantaneously, almost immediately. Uh, so, so what's the verdict? I mean, if, if it's illegal where you live, case closed. Uh, and in light of your body being the temple of the Holy Spirit, Christians should be cautious. Uh, outside of the medical use of marijuana, there's no known benefit and quite a bit that points to harm. And again, it's it's very different effect than with something like, you know, wine or craft beer or, or sipping whiskey or something. It's hallucinogenic. Uh, and I know what some of you are thinking. You, you're saying some people are there saying, no, it's not. No, it's not. And it's no different than getting a beer. And you would know that if you tried it. So how would you know about smoking marijuana? Well, two reasons. Uh, one, this is what medical science has concluded. Mm. But second, it's because I have smoked marijuana. And I know exactly how different it is than drinking something like beer or having a glass of wine. I didn't become a Christian until I was in my 20s uh, in college. And while I didn't try marijuana until I was a freshman in college, uh, mostly because I wasn't sure how it would affect me athletically and I was attempting to go walk on for basketball at my school, I certainly tried it. And unlike alcohol, it is a hallucinogen and it is different. It's much more mind altering. Uh, it's in a different class. Uh, even back then, when the THC levels were much, much lower than typical recreational usage is today. So I'm not going to say that this is absolutely categorically wrong for every Christian. I do think we need to ask ourselves, though, if using it is wise. And without a doubt, using it in excess is not. Mm. 
Before we leave the topic of marijuana, can we just touch really quickly on CBD? Like, is there any reason why a Christian might want to stay away from that? Not that I know of. Okay. Um, for those that may not know what you're talking about, a CBD is uh, is um, is short for a cannabidiol. Uh, as a substance found in both marijuana and hemp plants, uh, it does not make you high. Uh, CBD can be made into CBD oil and sold as pills and gels and creams and other formulas. Some use CBD to treat pain or seizures or other health problems. I will say that as of right now, scientists aren't yet sure whether or not it really, how well it works mm -hmm. for those things, or if it's completely safe over the long term. Uh, also, lack of regulation means you can't always know exactly what you're buying, the quality of it or something like that. Uh, so again, I'd be cautious about it. And, uh, but yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's talk now about drinking. I don't feel like there's as big of a stigma now for a Christian to drink casually as there was in previous decades, but it's certainly still a point of discussion, especially because there's there's a difference between, as you mentioned, like having a glass of wine with dinner and then drinking to get drunk. Or maybe I should let you answer that. Isn't there a difference between those two things? <laughs> the Bible has three basic things to say about drinking things like wine. And wine was the primary alcoholic beverage that uh, during biblical times and the one that is most referenced to in terms of what scripture has to say. So whenever the Bible refers to alcohol, it's usually referring to wine. Uh, that's the alcoholic drink. Uh, they had beer back then, but it didn't taste very good. So you can <laughs> see why most people drink wine. In fact, there was a team of archaeologists, one little side note, who tried to recreate biblical beer, what beer would have tasted like back then. And they said, you don't, we don't ever want to do that again. <laughs> So you can see why more people drink wine than beer, at least in that time. Mm. Well, here are the three things that the Bible says about it. First, that it's good for you. Um, the Apostle Paul even recommended it to uh, a young pastor named Timothy that he was mentoring. Uh, you can look this up. It's in 1 Timothy 5. And Paul told him to stop drinking only water and start drinking some wine because of his stomach and frequent illnesses. There was an understanding in that day that wine was a health drink, that it was healthy for you. So drink it to your health. Uh, today's studies seem to go back and forth, as you know, and up and down and left and right on the benefits of drinking. So one day and one study will say that it's great for your heart and good for other things. The other next day, another study says it's not good for you in a particular area. Uh, in almost all of these cases, it's usually when you're taking it, drinking it outside of moderation. But many studies uh, do laud its benefits, particularly in light of the benefits of um, resveratrol, which is um, a compound in wine and particularly stronger in red wine. There have been studies show that moderate consumption of wine can help prevent colon cancer and breast cancer and dementia. It can be good for your heart, it can be good for your microbiome, uh, meaning the beneficial bacteria and, and fungi and viruses that live in your body. Uh, which means it helps your immune system and, and food digestion and even diseases like irritable bowel syndrome. Now, granted, there are other studies that point out to ways it can be harmful too, and not to downplay that, uh, but that can be said of so many things that we ingest. Mm. Uh, but in writings like Paul's to Timothy, it was considered that it could be good for you and was good for you, and it was actually Paul recommended him to do it. Uh, second, the Bible says, and, and again, that's a narrative scripture. It's not didactic. There's nothing that says thou shalt drink wine for your health. But it is interesting that the Holy Spirit allowed that narrative to be included in the scriptures. Mm. Second, the Bible says that not only can it be um, good for you physically, but it makes many, many verses about how it can be good for you emotionally, uh, even to be seen as a gift from God and treated as a gift from God. In Psalm 104, it talks about how God gave us wine to make us glad. And in Ecclesiastes, it talks about drinking wine with a joyful heart. And then, of course, Jesus' very first miracle was, of all things, turning water into wine uh, for a celebration to continue with that alcoholic beverage and not run dry. Uh, he was at a wedding. They ran out of wine and Jesus miraculously created more. And yes, it was real fermented wine. It wasn't just grape juice. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing else would have been served in a wedding of that sort. And even the master of the banquet comments that not only was it 
good wine, but that most people don't bring out the good stuff until after everyone has had enough to drink that they couldn't <laughs> taste the difference. Uh, meaning that they were uh, appropriately, I think the term in the Greek is a little buzzed. <laughs> So, uh, so yes, it was maybe a little more diluted back then, uh, just based on the customs of the day to the strength of about a beer. Uh, but you know, it was definitely the real thing. So let's add up what we have from the Bible, uh, alcohol and specifically wine, which was the main alcoholic drink of that, of that day. And so you can extrapolate it out was considered to be good for you, even, um, prescribed by an apostle. Second, it was seen as a gift of God to cheer the heart and to use in celebration, and not only did Jesus make wine with his first miracle, but uh, and he would never have performed a miracle to facilitate a sin. Hmm. Never would have done that. Uh, uh, the Bible also records that Jesus drank wine. He drank. I mean, he even said he did. When answering some of the criticism that was coming his way, particularly that he wasn't following all of the added rules and regulations of the legalistic community, he took them to task for finding fault with people no matter what they did. And he famously said, you know, John the Baptist came abstaining. He didn't drink wine. And you said he was possessed. I came drinking wine and you call me a drunkard. You know, we can't win with you guys. Mm. Uh, and at the Last Supper, just before his death, right after um, passing the cup of wine, Jesus said that he wouldn't drink again of the fruit of the vine until he would drink it anew in the kingdom of God, which suggests there will be wine in heaven. Mm. Uh, having said all that, uh, there's something else the Bible adds to the conversation. Be careful with it. Hmm. Be careful with it. It should not fall over into habitual, ongoing drunkenness or into an emotional or physical dependence that consumes and then destroys, excuse me, your life. Um, this isn't about making the mistake of having one too many drinks or bad decision making, which all of us can fall prey to, um, but about giving your life over to it hmm. uh, or a life being taken over by it. And that doesn't bring physical health or emotional health. It brings destruction. Uh, its abuse isn't wise. And, you know, you, you can see lives completely taken over by this and destroyed, which is why in the great wisdom book of the Bible, uh, but you can see that about a lot of things, to be quite honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, and, but which is why in the great wisdom book of the Bible, uh, which, while it celebrates wine for our lives, it also cautions against its abuse. Um, so, well, so the Bible, while it is silent on marijuana specifically, it isn't silent on getting drunk. So how might we interpret its words for our modern context? Well, beyond what we've already talked about, mm -hmm. um, we can run it through our biblical paradigm. Is there a prohibition? No. Uh, is there permission? Absolutely. And not just permission, but even commendation. Are there principles? Yes. The main one is to try to keep it in moderation. Uh, so why are some Christians so hung up on this? Mm -hmm. Because they're not sure how best to keep it in moderation, mm -hmm. how best to, to walk that, that line. Uh, some, fearing any slip up at all, just feel like it's best to abstain completely. Others drink wine every day. Uh, and most of the time, they're able to self-moderate. So which one is living Christianly? Both. Both. Which brings us to the issue of wisdom. If drinking is, is something that begins to take over your life, as I mentioned, then you should be more on the abstinence side of things or take periodic breaks to ensure that it doesn't get a grip on you. Even if it's just taking a month off every now and then to recalibrate things. Um, if drinking stays in the health and joy category, um, even if you slip up from time to time and perhaps have one too many, it can probably stay in the partaking category. That's just common sense. And the Bible gives us the freedom to enter into that journey of wisdom. And, and, it, and it may be that it's a bit of both. Uh, I read an interesting article in Christianity Today, and um, we'll put it in the show notes. And it was titled, A Toast to My Journey with Wine. Hmm. And knowing that we were going to talk about this, I... I I remember reading it and I brought it with me. Okay. Uh, and so let me read uh, part of what she writes. She says, I love wine. I, I love the complex taste of it on your tongue, the nuances that I can sense but not name. It brings out the flavors of a good meal. It rivers between friends at a table, carrying the conversation to places you never meant to go. 
I love the feel of stemware in my hands and the way that red wine glows like a jewel in the kitchen light. I don't think it's a coincidence that it was a glass of wine that Jesus picked up during that last supper when he said, this is my blood of the covenant shed for many. Not water, wine. With all of its potential misuse, take, drink, do this in remembrance of me. When we do wine right, it's communion. It's a holy mystery. It's a gift. But it's also possible to do it wrong. And I have. I pour another glass, even when I know I shouldn't. At times, instead of talking about my pain and failures, my exhaustion and frustration, I drink about them. It's a fake and temporary solution at best and a wicked hangover at worst. Much of the time, I am able to keep my footing on that spacious path of sweetness and beauty. Mm. I'm glad you brought that. That's, yeah, thank you. Well, um, before we, we we end, I want to circle back to something that you had mentioned at the beginning with that structure of wisdom in terms of, you know, we our role in community. Like, I think an important factor in this conversation is that even if you decide that drinking is fine for you, it's not always fine for others and drinking around them can be hurtful. In fact, I know like even I'm a mom and even within like the motherhood community, um, you know, you can – you can thoughtlessly joke about, you know, needing to drink to cope with the stress of parenthood. I mean, there are endless memes about that, right? And um, But I was gently reminded by a podcast I was listening to recently about, you know, the fact that some parents are struggling with alcohol dependency, and it's really harmful to constantly hear all these references to, you know, in support of, you know, drinking at your parent, your kids driving you to drinking, essentially. So all that to say, like, how might we be wise and loving about the influence that our choice the influence of our choices when it comes to drinking. Well, that does bring up what we talked about at the beginning. Uh, so I'm glad we're returning to it for, you know, further conversation. In other words, how all this plays out in the context of community. In other words, what your freedom might mean to other people. The classic text on this comes from the Apostle Paul. Uh, we keep coming back to him. First Corinthians 10 is, is where he explores this. Some people within the church, he was dealing with a particular issue, and it was related to eating and drinking, but some people within the church were wanting to impose their sense of limited freedom on fellow believers in areas where full freedom existed. Uh, they wanted to impose their sensibilities. They wanted to impose their conscience on others where Scripture did not. And Paul wrote very specifically, don't let them do that to you. Don't let them do that to you. But then he turned to another group in the church, a group that were flaunting and abusing their freedom in Christ in a way that would hurt reaching those far from God. And it was in a very particular way, the eating of meat at a dinner event where they had been told specifically by the host that this meat had been offered to idols. Uh, while they had the freedom to eat the meat, uh, by the host telling them this, he was making it clear that he was identifying the meat as that which had been sacrificed to an idol, a false god. And for them to eat it, would be sending a signal that they recognized and honored that fallen false god too. Culturally, that's what it would mean. So while in Christ they had the freedom to eat the meat, because it meant nothing to them along those lines, it meant something to their host. And he was watching them to see what they would do. And in fact, he was doing it almost as a courtesy to them. You know, almost like he was saying, look, I know you're on the Christian side of things and I'm on the non-Christian side of things. So I need to let you know that this meat was sacrificed to an idol. And that's why we're having it here as part of this meal as a celebration. I'm eating it in that spirit and in honor of that idol. But I thought I'd give you a heads up about what's in front of you. Now, if evangelism is on the line, is what if what you are going to do is going to somehow muddy the waters about who you truly follow? Don't exercise your freedom. Uh, and that's obviously a pretty rare situation, uh, but it's a real one. It's a real one. So we need to exercise our freedom, not only in light of wisdom, but in light of, of witness. But don't make it more than that. Uh, it's not about offending another Christ follower who doesn't like you exercising your freedom. This isn't about offending the sensibilities of another Christian who wants to look down their sanctimonious legalistic nose at you in an area that they don't feel like you should be exercising freedom, where you have biblical freedom to do that. It's not about following a false moral code that really is a caricature of the Christian morality that doesn't really matter to a non-believer's assessment of the nature or object of your faith. Uh, if you're free in Christ, you're free in Christ, whether they want you to be free or not. 
So uh, no, this is not about handling that freedom in a way that would cause someone who is not a Christ follower. Um, uh, I'm sorry, what, what this is about is about handling your freedom in a way that would cause someone who is not a Christ follower to wonder whether there is integrity in who you say you follow. This is about handling that freedom in a way that would um, um, inadvertently or advertently uh, cause someone who is not a Christ follower to wonder whether there's any integrity whatsoever about who you say you follow. Not in terms of the perception of sinning. Paul is talking about the perception of disavowal. A uh, very important distinction. Do what you want within the confines of freedom. Uh, but in, if in so doing it, you may inadvertently be saying to the world around you that you might not follow Christ, uh, but another God, don't use that freedom. But no one would say that about drinking wine. Uh, if you saw me having a glass of wine at a restaurant or having a craft beer at a brewery, uh, you wouldn't think I was rejecting Jesus for another God. You wouldn't think that at all. So that's first. But now on to your scenario. Uh, in the New Testament book of Romans, the Apostle Paul talks about being careful how you exercise your freedom in light of how it may affect what others who are new to the faith or weak in the faith. He says over and over again, there's freedom to eat, there's freedom to drink, whatever it is you want. And for Christians not to judge other Christians who exercise that freedom differently than you do. The abstainers should not be judging the partakers. The partakers should not be judging the abstainers. But then he says, but live in such a way that you won't cause another believer to stumble and fall. Well, eat what you want, but it's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it causes another to stumble. Um, now here, Paul, again, isn't talking about Christians who legalistically are offended that you exercise your freedom to have a glass of wine or drink a beer or have a margarita for Cinco de Mayo. He goes out of his way to say Christians should not do that to each other in areas of freedom. And he says, what you drink is an area of freedom. So what is he talking about? The weak are those who are spiritually vulnerable to that area of freedom and you need to be sensitive out of love to their vulnerability. For example, with drinking, thinking about a brand new Christian who came out of, uh, who came to Christ out of alcoholism. Uh, do you want to take them out uh, for a drink while you mentor them in the faith? Do you want to say, let's have a standing date at this brewery? Uh, and while I get a beer, while I try to disciple you in your newfound faith, no, that would be insensitive and ridiculous. Uh, if they are a part of your small group and you know this about them, is it best to serve wine during that small group? Probably not. See, that would be using your freedom in an area where you're fine, they're weak in a way that could lead them to stumble. You're almost taking them to the area of their weakness and saying here, um, you know, re-enter this lifestyle that you desperately needed to leave. Don't do that. But again, those situations are very, very, very rare. It has nothing to do um, with whether someone drinks in other settings. Uh, but by and large, the verdict really is simple uh, with wine. Mm -hmm. Enjoy. Well, thanks for tackling the, this, um, I guess, these two topics. This was fun. I'm sure we'll do another one of these. Is it okay for a Christian to maybe not lifted from that previous series? But gosh, there are so many new topics that we could um, talk about too. So, But this is always such a helpful conversation, especially working again through that wisdom you know, structure. And because, yeah, there are just so many things that we're facing nowadays that don't maybe have that clear yes or no in the Bible, that this is just really helpful, a really helpful framework um, to understand how we can approach those. So thank you. Um, and guys, thank you for tuning in. And yeah, we'll see you again next week.